Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle DeMarzo, the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement at the Fairfield University Art Museum. Welcome to the first event of our fall 2021 season as we open the exhibition, Carrie Mae Weems, The Usual Suspects. If you've received our emails or seen our brochures, you know that our tagline for this fall is the art is live, the programs are virtual. All three of our exhibitions that are opening concurrently this weekend, Carrie Mae Weems, The Usual Suspects in the Walsh Gallery in the Quick Center for the Arts, and ceramicist Roberto Lugo and photojournalist Robert Gerhardt in the Bellarmine Hall Galleries will all be open to the public as of 11 a.m. tomorrow morning and open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. thereafter until December 18th. So we hope you'll visit our website for more information on all three of these shows and the virtual programming that we've planned to accompany them. And a little shout out to the folks who are at the Walsh Gallery right now engaging in a preview that was organized in conjunction with the Alumni of Color Network at Fairfield University. Tonight's opening speaker for Carrie Mae Weems, The Usual Suspects, Dr. Delila Scruggs, asked that I keep my introduction of her brief so that I might spend more time introducing, in her words, the genius of Carrie Mae Weems. For those less familiar with her work, Carrie Mae Weems is absolutely one of the most powerful voices in American contemporary art. Over the past four decades, she's crafted an extraordinary body of work that includes not only photography, the medium in which she began her career and in which she first gained prominence, especially with the Kitchen Table series of 1989 to 1990, but also short films, installation pieces, textile art, and much more. Listing the many museums that have exhibited and collected Carrie Mae Weems' work and the accolades she has received thus far in her career would take me far beyond the few minutes I have to introduce her. So to place a highlight only on a single year of 2013, Weems became the first black woman artist to receive a solo exhibition at the Guggenheim in what was then a 30 year retrospective of her career. In that same year, she received a MacArthur Fellowship. And since that is colloquially referred to as the MacArthur Genius Grant, our speaker tonight describing Carrie Mae Weems as a genius is applicable in more ways than one. Carrie Mae Weems frequently uses her own body in her work, exploring themes around Black life, family, and womanhood. She has never shied away from putting herself in the image, nor has she shied away from addressing the painful legacy of racism in our nation's history and its lived reality today, as she does in this exhibition, which was first shown at the LSU Museum of Art in 2018. Turning now to the speaker who will help us open this powerful exhibition, we are grateful to be joined tonight by Dr. Delila Scruggs. She is an art historian and educator currently serving as curator of photographs and prints in the New York Public Library's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Dr. Scruggs earned a PhD in art history in 2010 from Harvard University, where she focused on African-American art. She has held curatorial positions at the Williams College of Art and the Brooklyn Museum. Formerly, she served as the Brooklyn Museum's Education Fellowship Coordinator. Her talk tonight forms part of the Edwin L. Wiesel Jr. Lectureships in Art History, funded by the Robert Lehman Foundation. And please join me in extending a virtual welcome to Dr. Delila Scruggs. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. And thank you to Michelle and Carrie so much for guiding me through this entire process. So I have been invited here to discuss the work of MacArthur Genius Award winning photographer and conceptual artist, Carrie Mae Weems. But over and above that, I come to talk to you about Black people dying. I put this plainly because I do not want the aestheticizing language of art history to redirect our attention from the fundamental trauma of police brutality, which is the subject of uh, the usual suspects. When Fairfield first approached me to do this talk about a year ago, I had int intended to gradually develop my interpretation of Carrie Mae Weems' The Usual Suspects over the course of the year. But within a few months, I developed a heart condition. It was likely a symptom of long COVID. And fortunately, it seems to have resolved itself after receiving the vaccine, more or less but I would not doubt that I broke my own heart by reading about the destruction of Black bodies and dwelling with theories of Black subjugation. So I make this, I tell you this to make two points. First, 
I'm sharing you, with you the result of a personal wrestling with the uh, police brutality viral video. It's something that, you know, I guess from our Eric Gardner to uh, George Floyd, I've been wrestling with and feeling compelled as an art historian to kind of grapple with its imagery. But I don't come to these ideas on my own. And this, le this lecture isn't a product of my own invention, but instead I rely heavily on the brilliant writing of many scholars, but most especially with Charles Ward, who's been extensively about this body of work by Carrie Mim Weems, but also people like Sarah Lewis, Andrea Liss, Christina Sharp, Sherry Smith, and others. Um, and I've also had a really generative conversation with Courtney Taylor, the originating curator of this exhibition. Second, I share my own physical reaction to this material to emphasize that what we are going to see and discuss is traumatic. I was told to gear this presentation to an audience comprised of students, but also possibly the general public. And because of that, I feel it may be necessary to show some images that art historians and scholars of African-American studies could summon mentally without representing and reproducing the violence held within the image. But I'm sharing it here, I'll hopefully briefly, with the idea that we need to be grounded in the same points of reference. Uh, um, as I said, I'm here to talk about Black people dying, or more precisely, about Black people being murdered. Um, next slide, please. Given the difficult nature of this material, I would like to establish some community agreements for how we can be together. First and foremost, take care of yourself. If you decide, you can decide how much you engage with this lecture, this program. Self-care may mean walking away from the video briefly or logging off altogether. Um, unfortunately, because of the chosen platform, this means um, we are projecting potentially traumatizing material without providing a way that we can reconnect with one another and seek to process collectively. But that, in, that being said, I invite you to use the chat, share thoughts and questions. Um, but when you do, I ask you to be mindful of your words, be very careful of your words. Even though we cannot see one another, we are a gathering of people, of humans, and we can will into existence a community of care via the chat, even if uh, the institution has chosen a platform that makes, it, uh, makes us relatively anonymous to one another. Finally, I offer just one non-negotiable. My presentation operates on the understanding that the United States is a historically, it was historically and continues to be a white supremacist society. By white supremacy, I mean that white people benefit from structural advantages that grant them greater access to wealth, power, and privilege than non-white people. And this is done through overt violence, like police brutality, but also through institutions like schools, prisons, and even museums, which are designed to fortify racial hierarchies that place white people at the top of a social hierarchy and black people at the bottom. I, I invite you to wrestle with this definition of white supremacy on your own if you need to, but out of the care and concern for us as a group and the people of color who might be watching this program in particular, um, we cannot responsibly debate whether this country is white supremacist or not within the constraints of this program. Okay. Um, so at even, next slide, please. Even as we generate a community of care with, within and against the anonymity of the screen, we can also take care to acknowledge the victims of police brutality. In a moment, I will play an excerpt of Carrie Mae Weems' video, The People, People of a Darker Hue, which commemorates those felled by police brutality. This is one of the video works in the exhibition. As you watch, I invite you to remember the fallen uh, the victims of police brutality by saying their names. I invite you to say their names out loud in your personal space, but I also invite you to say their names in public by typing their names into the chat. Feel free to repeat the name as many times as feels needful. If you see someone else drop a name in the chat that you don't know, learn it now. Say their name, type their name. And ultimately, I'm hoping that we can collectively create a text waterfall commemorating the victims and set the appropriate tone for the gravity of the conversation that follows. And so I'm gonna ask um, Michelle to play the video.
she was a mother, a sister, a daughter, a wife, a mother, a child. The land of Castile. He was a father, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a son, a child. He was 37, he was 21, he was 31, he was 18, he was 12, he was 14, he was 17, he was 18. She was 21. She was 22, she was 37, she was 18, he was a father, a husband, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a son, a child, a friend, a wife, a mother, a sister, a friend, a child. Um, I'm looking at the chat. Thank you so much, everybody, for um, helping me commemorate um, these um, victims of police brutality in this act of memorialization. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So in this excerpt of A People of a Darker Hue, Carrie Marines not only charts a macabre timeline of state-sanctioned violence um, and murder from 1991 to 2016, but also underscores its development as a mainstay of digital culture. Indeed, the police brutality viral video has developed the status of genre unto itself. As these viral videos become more commonplace, the concomitant debate has arisen around the ethics of viewing these videos. Over and over again, when these videos flood our social media timeline, ask ourselves, is it important to bear witness to these gross violations of human rights? Or do we perpetuate the video's violence every time we view and post it? And in using this term, ethics of viewing, I'm taking my cue from media production theorist, Alexandra Juhas, who maintains that, quote, we, we must all take responsibility for our own acts of viewing and when deciding how or if to consume the viral video. Um, and what this scholar is saying is not that we just have to like meditate on our own watching of viral videos or even critically analyze the technical or compositional elements that produce the sort of frame of these videos, but really she's calling us to grapple with the ways that our own looking and our own knowing is by, shaped by and limited by systems that are larger than ourselves, systems of racism and sexism. And so further, to view or not to view is an ethical question subtended by a crisis in faith and the video's ability to affect change. Um, so I wanna pause and do a quick um, history of photography 101. Um, we tend to think of photography as being a transparent window into reality, that it somehow has, um, it, it serves as evidence of truth. And this is largely because of its mechanical nature. There's no intervention of the hand, it's not drawn, but also because of its indexicality, the idea that the action of light um, bounces off the subject of the photograph and hits a photographic plate, quite literally leaving a physical trace, like a fingerprint of that person, place, thing on the negative or photographic plate, right? And so it's a direct link with the external world. And we hold that as being evidence. Even though obviously um, scholars have long since deconstructed this idea that there's anything truthful about or unconstructed about the photograph. Um, but even in our popular culture, viral videos almost never result in police uh, convictions. And so they drain our already negligible belief that we still have and that photography holds any 
evidentiary power that's effective. Further, the numbing virality of these videos haunt our faith that bearing witness to the pain of others will necessarily yield empathy or awaken a sense of shared humanity. So next slide, please. Oh, we're already there. Okay, uh, we can go back. Um, can you go back one more, please? I'll just leave it here, sorry about that. Um, we believe, um, so I believe that Carrie Mae Weems, a usual suspect, the usual suspect engages with the ethics of viewing. Um, and to examine this premise, I will start first by contextualizing uh, the police brutality video um, within a visual history that precedes it. And then I will briefly outline the ways that looking or more specifically witnessing has been a constant theme of Karen Williams work. Then finally, I will focus on all the boys to demonstrate the polysemic ways that Williams encodes the ethics of looking into the usual suspects as a body of work. Okay, I'm ready for the scarred back now. Thank you. The police brutality video emerges out of a long history of photographic images depicting the torture of Black people that circulated in the public sphere to evidence the violated humanity of Black people and, highlighted, and highlights the spectacular violence enacted to enforce white supremacist or racial hierarchies. So for example, what I'm showing on screen is the carte de visite um, that captures an enslaved man known as Gordon who sought refuge behind Union lines in the Civil War. Composed to show the catastrophic scarring on Gordon's back, resulting from whipping by his former overseer, this photograph became one of the most iconic representations attesting to slavery's brutality at a time when Black humanity was a legal oxymoron. Um, and by oxymoron, I mean the law described enslaved people as chattel property, and yet here, antebellum audiences were confronted with, the enslaved, with enslaved people as quite literally flesh and blood. This photograph experienced the 19th century corollary to virality when it was reproduced in Harper's Weekly, a newspaper, which had a print run of over 100,000. Despite abolitionist faith in photography's evidentiary power to sway public opinion against the ills of slavery, um, theorist Dia Hartman has identified what she described as, quote, the precariousness of, of empathy and the uncertain line between witness and spectator in abolitionist texts. Hartman explains that even abolitionist propaganda, ostensibly motivated by a desire to prove the humanity of Black people, ultimately reified the objectification of the enslaved. So either by um, sort of numbing the white reader to the reader's response to the spectacle of torture or narcissistically prioritizing the white re reader's vicarious experience uh, over the actual lived reality of the black victim of torture. Um, next, uh, sorry, stay there for a second. Um, this instrumentalization of photographs of white supremacist torture and the resulting black death continued into the 20th century in the form of lynching photography. By lynching, I mean the extrajudicial torture of black people by white mobs. While the organizers of lynchings described them as a means of law enforcement, lynching was in fact a tool of racial control intended to terrorize black populations into submission. According to the Equal Justice Initiative, there were over 4,000 lynchings of black people in the South alone between 1877 and 1950. So I'm gonna issue a trigger warning here because I will briefly show you some examples of lynching photography. Um, I was really ambivalent about showing them and I'm not sure that this is the right thing to do, but again, I wanted to um, make sure that we're all on the same page about what we were talking about. But I should say that the very fact that this lecture is broadcast via YouTube mean rather than a more intimate setting of a Zoom means that um, we are amplifying the violence of these images. Okay, we're gonna show it very briefly. Uh, you can, so, okay, thank you. We'll stop there. So let me um, offer just a tiny bit of predictive covering for the moment and, and talk about these photographs. Lynching photographs originate as souvenirs. On the left, you will see a postcard picturing the charred body of Will Stanley. The back of the postcard um, down at the bottom there 
reads in part, this is a barbecue we had last night. And then this, this postcard, postcard was put in the mail. And so it circulated. And such postcards invite whites, not only those even whites that were not present in these gruesome festivities to then participate in the performance of white racial mastery by proxy. Conversely, or maybe I should say perversely, their display in public settings like grocery stores ensured that Black people who encountered these probably understood the boundaries of whiteness. Postcards served then to intimidate Black people by advertising the punishment for attempting to step outside their place in the racial hierarchy. Must, much as police dash cam footage finds its way into Black Lives Matter Twitter feeds, early 20th century lynching photography was appropriated by anti-lynching anti activists. And similar debates ensued about the effectiveness of this violent imagery to hold to sway public opinion and change federal law. So on the right of the screen, I'm showing you an illustration from the NAACP's publication, Crisis Magazine, where they use a lynching photograph, but radically reconceived its anchoring caption to highlight lynching as an act of racial torture. And yet even in this caption, they proffer the image as proof well, the caption kind of points to the failure of photography to deliver on its evidentiary promise. Okay, next slide, please. I'm gonna continue discussing lynching photography, but I'm gonna change the slide so we stop broadcasting the spectacle of white torture and black death. As a placeholder, I'm showing you the flag that is hung outside the NAACP office, that was hung outside the NAACP's New York City office, never news broke of yet another lynching. And then, um, on the right, I'm showing you Scott's contemporary work, which points to historical continuity between lynching in the late 19th and to early 20th century and police brutality today. In her chapter on lynching photography, Lee Rayford examines the rhetoric um, in, in the NAACP's Crisis Magazine and identifies a deep ambivalence about whether the putative facts presented by lynching photography could in fact lead to legislative change. Ultimately, Rayford identifies in lynching photography in a, in a poria, or an impossible internal contradiction that prevents these photographs from fully supporting the anti-lynching agenda. Ironically, the very thing that gives photography its sense of veracity, the way that it indiscriminately captures all the details of the scene, means that we too are presented with photography's indifference to black death. Moreover, Rayford notes that photography keeps the terror alive perpetually presenting us as a brutalized corpse. As she beautifully puts it, quote, the photograph is the wound that will not heal. Tracing this violence into the present, theorist Christina Sharp argues that there is no redemptive value to representing images of Black people destroyed, Black people's destroyed bodies. Drawing on writing by Sadia Hartman, Toni Morrison, and others, Sharp maintains that Quote, the repetition of violence is nothing to produce empathy, merely a rewounding and a re-traumatizing of Black people. And that says nothing to the, the ways that um, non-Black people, it kind of reassures um, the relationship between Black people and themselves and kind of keeps it quite stable that they are not that. Um, okay, next slide, please. So Karen May Williams is no stranger to this history. Um, as uh, Michelle has already outlined, uh, Williams is deeply committed to exploring what it means to bear witness to the past. And she's known for examining issues of race, gender identity, and history of these highly staged, beautifully choreographed photographs that are often accompanied by text. Um, I'm not, I cannot describe the capacious <laughs> and multifaceted nature of her body, her full body work today, but I'm going to underscore the ways in which my interest in the ethics of viewing dovetails with Beam's ongoing exploration of the gaze and of witnessing. So next slide, please. We can see Weems grappling with the violence of the anti-Black gaze, where she humorously explores here in this image the dam damaging effects of racism on Black subjectivity. Uh, next slide, please. In her series, from, um, from here I saw what happened and I cried, Weems sources a wide range of historical photography. Next slide, please. In this panel, she superimposes poetic verse over the appropriated image of Gordon uh, with a scourged back and the text and tones. 
quote, black and tanned, your whipped wind of change, how low, blowing its mouth itself, ha, smack into the middle of Ellington's orchestra. Billy, the, Billy heard it too and cried a strange through tears, end quote. So by linking tanning or heavy whipping to strange fruit, a mournful dirge about lynching by Billie Holiday, Weems charts a history that introduced racial oppression with resistance and resilience. Um, and then, um, next slide please. She's also um, grappling with uh, the, she also presents herself as a photographer who poses both behind the camera and in front of the camera as subject and, and photographer. She poses uh, not as herself, but as an alter ego, which first appeared in her renowned Kitchen Table series, a suite of 20 images and 14 text panels. And here Williams takes directly, um, um, picks up directly feminist film critic Laura Mulvey's critique of the male gaze that objectifies women. Williams in turn expands this critique to make space for a fully black fully human black woman who occupies multiple subject positions as lover, friend, and mother. Next slide. And more recently, she has transported her alter ego into the realm of landscape. In her Louisiana project, she poses on the grounds of slave plantations, using her body as a sublime repoussoir, redirecting our eye into the traumatic history of slavery. Next slide. She has also taken on the issue of police brutality earlier in her career, uh, albeit more obliquely in works like commemorating, here commemorating um, anyone who lives to the age of 21. Okay, um, so next slide. Okay, here we are with the subject at hand. In The Usual Suspects, she addresses state-sanctioned violence of police brutality head on, and in so doing, critically examines the discursive and semiotic morass that animates the production and reception of the vir of viral video, of the police viral video footage of police brutality. Rather than simply representing the viral video and hence reproducing its spectacular violence and trauma, she instead refocuses her photographic lens and to turn our attention away from the body and towards the ethics of viewing itself. Given the, given the time constraints, I'm gonna focus my analysis on just one work, All the Boys Blocked One. And we can go to the next slide. All the Boys Blocked One is a diptych, two images set side by side. At left, a hooded figure sits in full frontal pose. Um, the figure's exact contours are out of focus and shrouded in mist, but we can make out that it appears to be male and wearing a hoodie. To the right is a bureaucratic police document. The plaid patterning of the hoodie echoes the horizontal and vertical lines of the document grid. At equal size and placed on equal footing, the two images work as a pendant pair. Our historian Wendy Ikemoto reminds us that the etymology of pendant derives from the Latin pendere, to hang. The paired works operate as a pendant and they do so, um, to quote Wendy, by virtue of, quote, a fragmented connectivity that, is once, that at once enacts dispersal and gestures back through formal and thematic correspondence, end quote. So in other words, each panel does not stand alone but requires a contingent reading across works in dialogue. So um, I had to ask myself, well, what is the connection between these two panels? And if you'd like, you can also put it in your, in, um, in your, your own answer into the chat. What is the correspondence between these two panels? But to ask it another way, how do all the boys get hung as the usual suspect? The organizing uh, curator of the Usual Suspects exhibition, Courtney Taylor, once described this pairing as causal, and I know her thinking has evolved um, on this. This image, on, and for her at the time, the image on the left represented a clouded vision of the police, of the police officer whose view is obscured by imagined threats and stereotypes. And it is this a priori bias that ultimately leads to Black men's disproportionate arrest and incarceration as represented by the processing paperwork on the right. As Taylor compellingly observes, the blue hue invokes the glare of blue lights refracted against the atmospheric haze of the night sky. 
without discarding this interpretation as the before and after views of, police, of the police encounter, I would like to posit another take. The two panels are nearly identical in their role, in my opinion, as anti-portraits. They, they may be divergent in their pictorial strategies, but brutally alike in their interrogation of the discursive logic of criminology. Um, so next slide, please. For example, the full frontal and side pose of all the boys, profile one. Um, so let's take this for an example. Uh, what Charles Ward has written extensively about this and so I'm gonna be like sort of in his um, trail as I discuss further. And he has noted that the blurriness harkens back to the very advent of mudshot photography and the pose does as well. Um, I'm pointing specifically to English statistician and founder of eugenics, Francis Galton. And so for those of you who may not know, um, as a eugenicist, Galton was invested in identifying and perpetuating what he believed were the superior Anglo-Saxon genetics while suppressing what he believed were the inferior hereditary qualities of people who were Jewish, non-white, or disabled. Eugenics is now understood to be a racist pseudoscience associated with Nazi Germany, which sought to bring out, bring eugenics logic to its most catastrophic conclusion. So I'll show you an example of the kind of photography that Galton was commissioned, was doing, was, was using to make his argument. Next slide. Um, Galton's aim to harness photography's putative power of optical truth to identify a criminal type by superimposing several photographs of criminals to create a composite image. In so doing, he sought to visualize the statistical average of what a, a criminal looked like. So theoretically speaking, the composite image would display crisp features where there was a small standard of deviation and blur the areas where there was a greater standard of deviation from the mean. Um, so this requires a little bit of 19th century mentality. Uh, in the 19th century, there was a belief that the outside of your body, your physiognomy and your phrenology, the shape of your head and your features spoke to your internal character. And so what he was thinking is like, oh, if I take a bunch of photographs and I superimpose them, the thing that would be really crisp is that feature that is the criminal feature. So maybe criminals all have high foreheads or protruding foreheads and that would be really crisp in my composite images. And the things that are more variable and that's because their parents had that or whatever they inherited, that will be more blurry. Right. And so that's what he thought he would come in by creating this composite image, he would identify those criminal aspects. Like that criminal nose or that criminal forehead. Weems uses the Weems use of the phrase the usual suspects resonates with this historical attempt to identify the average or at least points to this historical attempt to identify the average or typological criminal. Next slide. Um, if we if we bring if we think of all the boys as invoking composite photography of criminology, then we can bring its relationship to the booking sheet into clearer focus. As um, as scholar Alan Sakula has observed in his well-known essay about this, um, his analysis of criminology's instrumentation of photography, he says, "quote The camera is integrated into a larger ensemble." a bureaucratic, clerical, statistical system of intelligence. So if we can say that the blurry photograph on the left bears the historical legacy of criminology statistics, the booking sheet also boils human existence down to biometrics of height, weight, eye color, and ethnicity. This process of optical blurring on the one hand and administrative abstraction on the other hand may be interpreted as what Christina Sharp, um, this brilliant theorist describes as an anagrammatical blackness. Um, and by that, she means the ways that the white supremacist worldview renders black people as illegible. And so I'm gonna quote her at length here. So she writes, we see again and again, how in the United States, girl does not mean girl, but for example, prostitute or felon. And boy doesn't mean boy, but Hulk Hogan or gunman or thug or urban youth. As the meaning of words fall apart, we encounter again and again the difficulty of sticking the signification. Um, next slide, please. 
forgive me for the the blurriness of this image. <laughs> um, it's not a good quality. Um, this accumulation of labels uh, attended with the loss of a stable meaning is emphasized in the Antonius work of the exhibition, The Usual Suspect. This work deploys a funda the fundamental conceptual art, some fundamental conceptual art strategies. Um, two things in particular, it is organized in a grid and features banal documentation. And these are two characteristics that have been described by our historian Benjamin Bluflo as the aesthetics of the administration. And Judy Smith is, is the person who has really identified the ways that Carrie Mae Weems has used the aesthetics of the administration in her own conceptual art practice. Here, the towering grid of police documents serves as Courtney Taylor um, has observed to press upon the viewer the cumulative fact, a pattern by which black men, women, and children are killed, and this violence is sustained. The impassive bureaucratic appearance of this work offers a visual answer to the rhetorical question posed by Judith Butler in the recent catalog, Recent Grievance. So she asks, wrongful death is a legal term, but do we yet have an equivalent for those whose premature death seems to be a governing presumption of their life, of wrongful life, right? This idea that the state this has, using all this paperwork, this police paperwork, just continues to support the notion that, that it's legal and, and justified for the state to kill black people. And, and this grid supports the kind of mounting paperwork that reflects the mounting deaths um, uh, that result from police brutality. Next slide, please. So um, the fact that Weems pairs an image of the hooded male with what is actually Sandra, what is like a replica or a remaking of Sandra Bland's booking sheet in all the, in this particular work, All the Boys Locked One, emphasizes the ways that Black people's unique humanness is obliterated in the wake of white supremacist visions of Blackness. For Sharp, the climate of white supremacy is all consuming, but she identifies a few ways that black people have resisted. And so I'd like to end by proposing that Karen Mae Weems' work does not simply represent the conditions of invisibility and dehumanization of black people, but proffers an ethics of viewing that opens up space for resistance and critique. Um, one might consider, for example, the benefits of blurriness. And if you want to read a really robust um, argument for this, I really refer you to LaCharles Ward's work. Um, and I'm sort of, again, trailing his and maybe using slightly different tacks, but it's really his work that I'm borrowing from here. In, in, a, in her recent exhibition, Romancing the Shadow, curator Anita Bateman pulled together an array of works by African-American artists, which she considered to be anti portraits, and she, um, which she defines as visages that challenge the impulse to be known, comprehended, categorized, or easily defined. Drawing on what Martin Meekin philosopher and poet Edward Bissant has called the right to opacity, Bateman asks us to consider, quote, the potential won by resisting the gaze through anti-visibility. And so she explains, I'm going to, she's, I'm going to just quote her at length so that she can explain on her own terms. Quote, this anti-visibility is not the same as being invisible. Rather, it is the power to operate against systems of imperial domination, including the gaze. It asks, how can we force the gaze to surrender? What if explanation were off the table? End quote. So to put it way more flatly, <laughs> if the white gaze was always gonna result in violent distortion of black identity passed off as knowledge, then why not seek refuge in the refusal to be seen or known? And the Galatonian interpretation I offered earlier dovetails with this uh, explanation, I, I think. Uh, the overwhelming blurriness of all the boys actually points to the failure of photography to produce any average or usual suspect. The standard of deviation is just too wide to produce human variety down to type. It's all blurry, there is no type. This approach to photographic profiling fails to produce valid findings, even within the own logic, the um, criminality's own logic. Moreover, all the boys avoid spectacularization of Black death in ways that uh, not, would not only result in the re-traumatizing of Black viewers, but the re-victimizing of 
black photographic subject. So that's something I've clearly sort of wrestled with and in, in some cases failed to do to protect the subjects of, that I've presented here in this presentation. Weems takes this anti-visibility one step further by applying a red rectangle over the face of the figure, rendering a crimson redaction over an already fugitive, to use Ward's term, a fugitive image. Here, I use another one of Christina Sharp's analytics, the notion of redaction, which she defines as a kind of blocking out that refuses to, quote, accede to the optics, the discipline, or deathly demands of the anti-Black world in which we live. So again, the, the redaction I'm pointing, that I'm going to call redaction here is that red rect rectangle um, on the left uh, panel. The figuration nearly impossible to parse, this image actually, at least for me, pushed me to engage with the formalism of the image. For me, that was the moment when I started regarding it at, through formalism, rather than like going straight to, oh, this is a black man in a hoodie, I realized, wait a minute, this is not just, this is not a portrait of a black man, but instead it became a formalist composition in red, white, and blue. In all the boys, anti-visibility and redaction forced America to see itself and visualize what black pessimist philosophers have maintained that American notions of democracy and progress are predicated on black death. So, so to sum up, Liam's use of pictorialist blurring and aesthetics of administration not only speak to uh, the discourses of criminality that shape how black people are seen and made known within white supremacist logic and the violence of that. Um, in my opinion, the work's greater power is in that, in that it refuses to just be that. She calls us into an ethics viewing that confronts, that confronts us instead with the fundamental Americanness and what I've described as this long history of Black death and racial subjugation. Thank you. Let's see. Um, if there Talila, first, I wanted to thank you for, you know, dealing with, you know, these very painful material and making it accessible to our community and our students and giving them the grounding both visually, even though that was especially traumatic, I understand, and then also theoretically. I mean, you provided so many threads for our audience to follow, and I want to thank you also for repeatedly referring to the scholars whose work you're drawing on, since our audience had so many opportunities to track where your ideas were coming from and then follow through. I'd encourage anyone who might want to put into the chat a clarification of a name. We can certainly give you that, a spelling of a name, for example. And I'll invite our community who has been active in um, the quick live chat. If you have questions for our speaker and would like to put them in the chat now, uh, we can go to those. I guess one of my questions for you, Dalila, since I know that you know, in our discussion very early on, we talked about the the dream of bringing Carrie Mae Weems herself to Fairfield, which was not, she is, you know, one of the most sought after artists, unsurprising that her catalog, her calendar was completely booked. But I would just wonder if, let's say you had her in your viewing audience tonight. I know, I, I know the look that was gonna produce. <laughs> if you could ask her a question about the work, forget what question she might pose to you, but if you could ask Carrie Mae Weems a question about the work, is there one that you would want the artist's perspective on? Oh, there's so many. Oh, um, I, I guess I would, I want to, I would want to know a little bit about where she was and what, what moment, um, what was the moment that kind of catalyzed this work? What was, where, where was she when the, the germ of this, of this exhibition started? You know, she starts with 1991 in um, People of a Darker Hue, but I'm wondering uh, at what point was it? 2016, where she felt compelled, or, or had she been meditating on physicality for much longer, like the commemorating plates? So I would, I would love to know just like where was she, where she was. Um, I would love to know, like because she is grounded in photography, I would be interested in knowing what the outtakes were. Um, you know, whether she, you know um, whether blurry, blurry, the blurring of the image was always at the at the origin. 
of this work or whether she arrived there because she was grappling with this ethics of doing that, that um, kinds of scholars who have taken up her work have, have needed to, to um, engage with. Um, and yeah, those would be my, my two greatest questions. I'd also be interested in, um, in, in her, you know, she's an archive, you know, she does archival work. And so I would be interested in um, what her source material was, not just for the kind of studio photography, which I assume is um, the source of uh, the panel on the left, but where she's getting and what are her models for the kind of constructed, you know, how she constructs the police documentation. I'm, I'm not clear about whether this is like directly quoted. I think that these are not, but these are things that she's created, but obviously are made to look very official and to replicate the, um, the administrative functions or like the look of, of uh, police documentation. So I'd be curious um, what her archival work was like or how she was um, looking at that documentation. You know, that observation, and I caught that when you said it during the talk that, oh, this might be a recreation of the police documentation, reminded me yet again of, well, you've made the point in the beginning, we fall prey to the belief that photography is reality. So of course, I'm looking at this originally, I assume that I'm looking at a photograph, a true representation of Sandra Bland's booking sheet. Okay. But of course, as you say, this could, all, this could also be the artist at work and we're not given to know. And, and that parallels the, sort of the, um, the ways that actual police documentation is also constructed, right? And obliterates certain pers um, perspectives um, and is given cover under the look of uh, like the auspices of the official record. Mm -hmm. Picking up on one other thing you just mentioned, and I think you had referred this to Charles Ward, the, the fugitive image in referring to this blurring, which is is, is a very powerful way to think about it since they're being associated with criminality. But is there, has there been a previous echo of that in her work that you've seen other examples of sort of blurring the edges or is this sort of a new approach that she was taking with this body of work? Um, she's definitely used um, blurring before. Um, I, uh, even, in, even in the show, there are other examples, Blue Notes, which comes from a is, is, mm. a, is an earlier body of work, but also uses blurring. I, I wouldn't claim, I'm, I just am gonna say that I'm not, I can't speak further to whether um, the blurring in, in Blue Nose is directly related to the same kinds of um, ethics of viewing I'm claiming for uh, the usual suspects. Okay. So I have seen a praise for this talk in the chat. I have not seen any questions. I do wanna leave space another few minutes for um, anyone who might have a question or a comment that they would like to share. Um, I don't know if you have anything final that didn't come up in your talk, we were talking about things that get cut. Was there any remark or observation that you felt you had to cut for time, even if it's just another praise of how amazing Carrie Mae Weems is? Always that, always <laughs> that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm. I'm well, I just want to um, reiterate my um, gratitude to Fairfield University for um, for inviting me to do this. I, you know, I had been thinking about uh, the history of police brutality videos, but I didn't have an anchor to do so until um, this invitation. Um, and I'm so glad it got to be with Carrie Mae Weems' work. <laughs> um, I guess if I were to add things like I cut, there's a Karen May Williams is not alone in her investigation of police brutality videos. But Christina Sharp, I think, is, is working on a project where she's looking at other ways, other ways that artists have chosen not to represent the violence, but but do other but commemorate the death um, and brutalization of black bodies and um, but through other means, through other visual means. Um, and so there's like so many interesting contemporary artists that are doing that. I mean, in the in the in the, my PowerPoint, I shared Dred Scott, um, but there's there's so many others that now that I'm forced to remember them, <laughs> I'm something <laughs> on. <laughs> um, uh, but but I know Christina Sharp. Uh, if you go to, um, if you'll find presentations of hers on YouTube where she's talked about this project where she's looking at that material. There's also a um, a journal issue of um, CAA's American Art History. Um, journal that's dedicated entirely to police brutality. And so Sarah Lewis and Lee Rayford have fantastic essays talking about other artists that are doing great work. 
Um, so it's really good to know that um, contemporary artists are leading the way for all of us to um, help metabolize and process and, and um, become really clear about our ethics around his, his brutality and his imagery. So even in your, in your cut comments, you're providing more of these threads for us to follow out into art historically and into the scholarly community, which is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. We have another praise coming through in the chat, but also what question from Gail. She says, can you please explain the idea of anachromation again? Oh, well, I love that turn of phrase, anachromation. That's, that's not what um, Christina Sharp, but I think that's worth a, a theorization of its own, <laughs> like the, against uh, uh, the uh, distortion of color. But what she said was anachromatical blackness. And let me, um, let me pull up the definition so I'm reading it exactly correctly. But, um, Sorry, excuse me. Um, okay, anagrammatical blackness. So um, the ways, basically this kind of abstraction or the ways that white supremacist world, the white supremacist worldview renders black people as illegible, right? And so uh, the quote where you see this with, um, with the justification that police officers use, right? Oh, I didn't see that it was a, a 12 year old little boy named Tamir Rice. I thought he was a grown man, right? You can't even, the, the inability to see um, black people for who they are, children or fathers or sons, but instead always sort of distorting them into these other things for them to you know, prostitute, felon, um, the way that the, the, um, the police officer who killed um, Mike Brown, he said that it was like a Hulk Hogan, right? Because Hulk Hogan and Mike Brown don't look anything alike. And so that's the degree to which this kind of um, um, against legibility, anagrammatical blackness happens. Anagrammatical. Gail, thank you for asking for that clarification, which is great. Thank you to everyone who has tuned in tonight, who participated in the chat waterfall earlier and commemorating the names of those who have been lost to police violence. And I want to offer our, our deep thanks and gratitude again to Dr. Delila Scruggs for joining us this evening. And we will look forward to seeing you all in person in the galleries and virtually for programs. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.